You don't have to throw someone's life away because they made a bad choice at one point in their life and that people can be rehabilitated. So for me, I always, always say if someone does the crime, they should do time. But what is fair time? I'm super excited to be here uh, talking to the great Kim Kardashian about the Justice Project, which is this unbelievable documentary uh, that she's put so much uh, blood, sweat and tears into. Um, We are going to be talking about the documentary, but not just the documentary. The fact that Kim Kardashian has become such a powerful advocate for criminal justice. Why? What does her family think about it? How does she feel about it? How does she choose who to help? There's so many questions. But first, let me just say, welcome to Kim Kardashian. How are you doing? Hi, I'm good. It, it honestly feels good to get up and put on something else but pajamas, put on some makeup. <laughs> I miss work, you know. It does feel good to get up. I had to sneak out, and I'm in my mom's house. She, um, <laughs> We're all not seeing each other, really, so I had to go in her back door and come in this room. I had to sneak away from my kids, to be honest. Yeah. So I'm, I'm well, loving this break. <laughs> I know. Well, you know, it's, um, it is important, and we should probably just address that right at the very top. You know, we're in this age of the virus, this age of the pandemic, the age of the quarantine. What concerns do you have for people behind bars uh, in the age of the pandemic? Well, first of all, I want to thank the governors who, um, you know, have been releasing some people that are incarcerated, which is amazing. And I really commend them. Um, I sent a tweet out to Governor Newsom thanking him for that. Um, You know, I think that it's really tough for visits to be canceled because of this. And I understand the, the, the logic behind it, but to not replace it with phone calls with some kind of other interaction, I think is cruel and there has to be some some kind of change with that. That really breaks my heart that these people just have to now not have any connection with anybody when they really depend on that. Absolutely. And I, I know you're a good friend, uh, Jessica Jackson and Aaron Haney, who are in the documentary, which we're going to get to, um, have put put out from the Reform Alliance this whole safer plan to try to get some people out. You know, there are people who could come out safely, uh, you know, who are well and who are not a threat to anybody. Uh, some of the governors have been asked uh, by the National Governors Association and others, Reform Alliance and others, to you know have fewer people you know going in. If you know some petty stuff, don't put them in. Um, if they can come out safely and be on home confinement, let them come out, and then let's rush in medical supplies and and uh, and masks and that kind of stuff. So there's a big effort to try to help people be, you know behind bars, and I think a lot of the consciousness that people have about what's going on in the prisons has a lot to do with the work that you've been doing. Um, and, and many, many others. I noticed at the top of the documentary, you point out that, you know, you are new to this issue um, and you're still learning about criminal justice. Why was it so important for you to, to say that at the top, that you are, are a newcomer to this cause? Because I am. And I think sometimes the way the media can spin something or make it seem like I am doing this all on my own and I'm not. And I've always been really vocal that it's a team of people. As soon as I read a letter or hear a case, I'll send it to Jessica and Aaron, who you introduced me to. Um, And they are like my girl squad team of attorneys that we talk about every case. We'll be up online all night long texting each other about specific cases, about exactly what's going on, what's going on with coronavirus in prisons. At every last issue we talk about. And so I think yeah. one of the, the reasons I really wanted to do this documentary is because I feel like it shows, it, it's like my journey of what I've learned. And I've never been shy to say that I started off probably judgmental and feeling like, okay, well, Alice Johnson, nonviolent drug offender, I can handle that. Like, if, as long as there was no violence involved, I, I, can, I can support that. Until I started to educate myself and visit prisons and go and speak to people that are incarcerated and understand their backstory. It's something that I never took the time to even think about before. I met with so many people that at, in, at, when they were a teenager, they committed horrific crimes. But now in their 30s, 40s, they are a completely different rehabilitated person. And even though they did that and made that choice and mistake to do something really awful, doesn't mean they are that mistake. and doesn't mean that they haven't rehabilitated and don't deserve a second chance at life. When you're 16 years old, your brain isn't even really formed yet. 
Um, you can yeah. do you can you can do something. You can have a bad you know weekend or a bad summer and then get your act together and then never have a problem again in life if you grow up in the suburbs if you have money. Um, but you know some people wind up in real trouble. Uh, why do you, why is it so important to you to humanize people who have made really really serious mistakes? I want to humanize as many people as possible, but not just in like a. a low level drug offense case. Like I wanted it to be in a sex trafficking case in every situation that you could imagine and really feel empathy. I just want people to feel empathy and so that they can feel that truly in their hearts, if they were to get to know people and hear their stories, that they would definitely feel safe with these people re-entering back into our society. And I think think that's the great thing about this documentary is, you know, the, the people who you're showing, the people who, you know, somebody who actually, you know, killed a man. You say to yourself, somebody killed the man. I, I don't want that person ever to come back out. And then you understand the circumstances of her being trafficked and abused and all these different things. You start to reveal and you start to think to yourself, OK, I've now got a different perspective. Um, I yeah. want I want to ask you about the importance of context and that sort of stuff. But before I do that. I still think a lot of people are just trying to get their minds wrapped around how could Kim Kardashian, megastar, superstar, be walking around in prisons and jails and all this sort of stuff. People at first thought it was a publicity stunt. Now, a couple years later, it's obviously not, you know, you can get publicity doing whatever you want to. This is clearly a passion. But, you know, what would your dad think about this? I mean, your dad was a lawyer. I mean, what would your father think about the, about what you're doing, this, this turn your life has taken? I think he would love it. We have had the conversation, though, about um, going to law school, him and I. When I was in college and I was trying to think of what my major would be, I thought, okay, I can like major in political science and I could really do this. And, and then he was like, listen, like you've seen the hard work that it puts in. I don't doubt that you can do this, but it's a really stressful life to be an attorney. Do you really want to be an attorney? And then I ended up majoring in communications instead. And so we talked about it a lot because he always saw me snooping in his stuff and looking through all of his evidence books and (laughs) like in the summer times when all my friends were hanging out and he was just like, go have fun. There's, you know, you can, you can always do this later. And honestly, sometimes it is so tough. And I have these assignments that I feel like I have to succeed in and I get really overwhelmed and I feel like quitting sometimes, but I know that he's like right there pushing me to just be like, you can do this. And so I always like take a minute, I stop and I'm just like, okay, I'm going to finish my work the next day. I need a breather. It's like too Mm -hmm. overwhelming for me. And then I get up super energized and get back at it. And I know that's like him pushing me to do that. Uh, you know, it's amazing. I think for the younger generation, you're the most famous Kardashian. You know, they heard of you. For my generation, it was your dad <laughs> that was the big guy. You know, you're kind of like his kid coming up from our point of view. And so, you know, we know that you got that legal beagle in your blood because, that, you know, he was such an amazing attorney and, you know, such a, such a big deal uh, culturally as, as well as legally. Let, what, but what about your kids? You just said you're, you're, you're a refugee right now in your mom's house from your kids. Uh, you got little bitty kids. What do they think about what you're doing? How do you explain to them that, you know, mommy is going into prisons to help people? Does that even come up? It does. And so I, she traveled with us to Houston when I went to go visit Rodney Reed and she was with me, but she had to stay in the car while I went inside. Um, And I had to explain to her, like, we're at, you know, a prison and we're going to be going in and I'm going, you know, in, and she was like, well, mommy, I know you're just going to help people. Like, I know you're not going to jail. So she really understands. I think because she's around a lot when I'm studying with Jessica and Aaron. And so Mm -hmm. she'll just hear all the conversations. She'll hear me studying my flashcards. She'll hear me like talk to myself and call things out and say definitions and stuff (laughs) like that. Or she'll hear me on calls like that I'm when I'm dealing with um, different legal teams and stuff like that. So she's really smart. She's really aware of what's going on and if anything that like pushes me more because I really was the type where I didn't love school like I didn't love college and um, high school was so much fun but then college it just wasn't my thing so to know that now that I'm almost 40 and I love it and I love going to school like I love having that as a good 
example for my kids too, that like no matter what age, if you find something that you're passionate about, you can absolutely go for it. And it's a really personal goal of mine. So one time you're talking about like you got your backpack with your books and your kids kids have their backpack with their books. And you're know, like doing like the mommy and me on the study and stuff, which I think is really, really awesome. And I think it's just so important for people to, to see and hear that this, this is not just something you show up for for the press conferences or something like that. This is the daily part of your life, learning how to become a lawyer and dealing with all these cases. How do you decide uh, I mean, when the letters come, when you, you see something in the news, I mean, what is the process that you go through to pick who to help? Because that's, a, that's I mean, that's a big decision. Well, the good thing is because, um, you know, Cut50 sponsors me and my apprenticeship. I know a lot about what goes on in the office and what policy you guys are working on and the team's working on. So if I see you guys are, you know, trying to work on something that involves like a specific gun charge or something, I'll read letters. And if that pops up, then I'll put that in, in that pile. And so then I'll send all of those to Jessica and be like, I think you guys are working on this. This might be helpful to you. Um, and then I have a different groups of people that I feel like if something comes up in the first step acts, then I know that we can, you know, help that and that category. And then other letters that have nothing to do with any of the policy that anyone's working on, it's like a feeling that I get. When I read Don's letter and Don's in, in the documentary that I did, I cried right away. She was so in depth and detailed her entire story to me and it just broke my heart. And I thought, I have to help this woman. I don't know how we're gonna do it. I didn't know anyone and she's in New Jersey. So it's like starting these relationships with the governors and figuring out what can be done and getting her a, an attorney that can properly um, fight for her. So every case is different. It's usually a feeling. There's sometimes I wanna help so badly and I know that there's nothing I can do, but I'll still write them a letter back and try to give them a little bit of um, peace and just thank them for reaching out to me. So I try to help as many people as I can. And sometimes we were successful and sometimes we're not. And that breaks my heart. Yeah. You know, I think that the, um, you know, I was a, a founder for Cut 50 and along with Jessica Jackson and, and Matt Haney and uh, Matt Haney's big sister, Erin Haney uh, and Jessica uh, still help on the Cut 50 side. We also help to run the Reform Alliance. Um, and uh, I think people assume that you get some kind of special pass uh, because you're so famous or whatever, but you actually work as hard or harder than anybody we've ever had on the team. Um, and sometimes we got to keep up with you. I just think I just want to I mean, I, I have no reason to say it if it's not true, uh, because, you know, whatever you're doing is more than uh, people probably expect you to do. But I just want to say it's been very incredible to watch the level of dedication and discipline that you brought to this thing. You did mention earlier, and I want to come back to it, this idea of context, what they call mitigating circumstances. Somebody did something on his face. You say, this is just terrible. But then you learn something behind it and you say, oh, well, that makes makes me see it a little bit differently. Can you talk about that in the context of, of Alexis Martin, who's in the documentary? Yeah. So Alexis Martin, she was at 14 sex trafficked by someone who she felt like was a father figure. Um, she had a really rough life at home, always um, being passed around from place to place. She had lived with him for a while. I think it was a few years of this and it would get, you know, deeper and, and crazier and, and a really rough life for her. So she was on a text message with someone and they said they were going to rob him, the home that she was in. And that they would give her a cut of the money and so she would be able to break free and go live a different life now. There was no, dis uh, no discussion of violence. They just knew that they were going to come in and rob some things, some items or cash. She knew that cash was in the home. Um, so because there was that text message, they come into the home. She At that moment while they got robbed, she was being raped by her pimp's brother. And so the guy that was raping her got killed. I mean, sorry, got shot, but lived. And then her pimp got killed and none of that was in the plan. And so she was charged with his murder and attempted murder of um, his brother. And um, she just knew that they were, someone was going to come in and, and, and rob them, but she knew nothing would, would be violent. And she was just trying to look for a way out and try to get right. some money. And that was her only option. And there was also, 
a particular law that was put into place protecting minors from sex trafficking victims and her lawyer at the time didn't know that. And so she has gone back for um, ineffective counsel and the lawyer has even signed off and, and is trying to help saying that he knew he was ineffective, which is really rare to get from a, an attorney um, yeah. that will admit that. For, for an attorney to admit that they did not do a good job is unusual. So you know that attorney must feel really bad for the fact that this, that this young woman is, is in that situation. I just, again, what I love about this documentary and, and, and the, the whole approach that you have is, you know, you're, you're going way beyond the safe and simple and easy. You're getting into the real complexity, but that's real life. You know, real life is messy. And, and it, I always say if it's not paradoxical, it's not true. I mean, there's nothing that's just super clean or super easy. If it is, it's super phony. And it also and went along with my journey of me feeling like I'm just like you. I'm, you know, the person out there watching. I'm, I felt like I don't know how I would be able to support this and really rally behind this until I took the time to educate myself and meet with numerous people, dozens of people that were so generous to share their stories with me and be so open and it really changed my mind. And so I hope that this can change people's mind and people can just have empathy because I love um, crime shows. I watch every crime show you could possibly imagine, but I've never seen a crime show that is from the other side. It's always from the victim's point of view and their family, unless it's like, you know, some intense serial killer that wants to tell their whole story. You never see these, um, stories and and people really admit their wrongdoings and tell how they got there and i think that's really important for people to hear i think sometimes people hear a, a, you saying or me saying or others saying well if somebody had a bad life then just let them out of jail that's not what we're saying we're just saying that you have to look at the, the totality of the person everything that happened to them and also their pathway toward redemption if somebody makes bad choices and then they began to make better choices, that should count too. You don't have to throw someone's life away because they made a bad choice at one point in their life and that people can be rehabilitated. So for me, I always, always say, if someone does the crime, they should do time. But what is fair time? And that's, that's the struggle. Somebody watching the documentary or, or hearing the sound of your voice, what do you hope that they'll do to make a difference in this issue? I hope that people, you know, if they're passionate about someone in particular or uh, an issue in general, that they reach out to their governors, that they speak up about how they feel about people being, you know, wrongfully incarcerated or reach out to Cut 50 or any organization that you feel like is doing an amazing job to push these issues and you know volunteer or ask how you can be helpful it's usually lots of calls to the governors are are helpful and just using your voice to speak out um someone used their voice to speak out about alice and tweeted about it i saw it and so we were able to really change her life but it was a bunch of us that made that happen yeah you know uh, uh Brittany barnett topeka sam there are all these different people, Shaka Senghor, like we have, there's a whole community of people, um, some formerly incarcerated, some directly impacted. And, um, you know, all of us are better off uh, because you've joined this cause and joined this fight. And I think this documentary is going to open up a lot of eyes. Um, I appreciate getting a chance to spend time with you. Uh, ReformAlliance.com and Cut50.org are two places you can go for more information. Cut50.org and ReformAlliance.com. Thank you, Kim. Bye.